before we calculate these scales and rotation changes. So let's say we have a, a test image. We found a feature at x1, y1. So let's define the origin of the object in that test image as, let's say, the, the upper left corner. So that means that uh, if I find a feature in the test image, the origin is at vector v1 with respect to um, the feature location, where v1 is just this. So in a tr in, that, that was a training image, I'm sorry. In a test image now, let's say we, we find what we think is the same feature at x2, y2. We can apply that vector offset to find the what we think is the origin of the object in this in this image. But if there's a scale and rotation change, we have to apply that scale and rotation change um, to get the, the actual location of the object. So imagine doing this for many possible features. Um, they should all vote for the same location, and they should all have this same relative scale and angle change. To compute that, let's say we have two sets of features. We have two features, x1, y1, angle 1, scale 1, and the corresponding one from image 2. The uh, scale ratio is just s1 over s2. The difference in angle is a1 minus a2. So uh, to apply that uh, scale change and angle change to the offset, uh, I would multiply, I actually divide V1 by S and multiply it by the uh, rotation matrix here. So this code um, goes through all sets of matches and calculates the scale ratio and the angle change between them. This just forces the angle to be between minus pi and plus pi. Um, and then it stores those. So those are the votes that we're going to be um, looking at. The, um, and then it, finally we'll just plot that. So this is what I get for that. Um, this uh, plots all those matches in terms of their scale, ratio, and angle difference, and the x and y location in the uh, image. So we see clusters here of um, points. These are matches that have a similar angle sc change and scale change or a similar, similar location in the image. And I just printed out some of them here. Okay, so now we want to find those clusters. We can use a Huff transform. It's actually 4D, remember. Um, we're going to make it very coarse, as you can see here. And that's okay because uh, it's just a uh, approximation to the transformation anyway. Um, note that uh, Lowe recommends also voting for neighboring bins to mitigate uh, boundary effects where votes are split, say, between two adjacent bins. So this is the uh, code that calculates the Huff transform. Here is the four-dimensional Huff space H. Um, this, get, this goes through each of the matches, finds the bin that's closest to that point, and increments H at that point. And then this here finds um, all the bins with three or more features and prints those out. So this is what I get from that. Um, it found four uh, peaks with these numbers of points in them centered at these locations of X, Y, scale, and angle. So just to see what the H looks like, it's um, four-dimensional with these sizes. And here's a um, sort of a slice through one of them showing a, a peak here. OK, so let's, uh, let's say if I just want to find the largest bin. So that's the most likely location of the object. Of course, if there are multiple objects in the image, you would want to look at multiple bins. So this code just goes through the features again, tests to see if the feature is in that bin that I'm looking for here. And this, this code displays the features corresponding to that largest bin. So what I get is um, my largest bin has seven features. Here are the indices corresponding to that. And here is the actual matches shown here. So they seem to be correct. Um, and it, it basically, you could stop here and say, yes, I found the object is approximately here. 
but we'll go one step further and fit a transformation to those features that we think are correct. Um, the transformation will be a 2D affine transformation, and that will that can allow shearing, rotation, scale, etc. So this is a better approximation than the just the simple 2D scale rotation that we found with the Huff transform. And if we check the residual errors of these matches, we can uh, we can potentially throw out uh, outliers. Um, now, of course, if we if we had this this requires a minimum of three points, but if we had more than three, we might want to fit an essential matrix um, to allow even better transformation. So this is the code that fits an affine transformation to those two sets of points. Um, it's going to form the um, equation ax equal b, where x is our unknown uh, values in the affine transformation. And finally, we'll, we'll estimate the error in the image point measurements uh, from the residual. And we can use that to detect um, bad fits or outliers. So this is that uh, matrix A. Here's our unknowns x that we solve for. And here's the vector B. So pulling those um, elements out of X and putting them into a 3 by 3 affine transformation, we get this. Um, and our error is pretty low. It's only 0.29 pixels. So we'll visualize this by applying the affine transformation to the uh, training image. And that should align it with the test image. And then we'll just go ahead and, and blend those two images and display them. So here was the, uh, the test image. Here is the training image that is um, warped and scaled using the affine transformation. And then this um, is a blending of those two. And this is a blow up of the two. So it looks like it's a pretty good match for that object. Some simplifications I used in this uh, demonstration only used a single training image of each object. I only looked for a single object, instance of the object. Um, I didn't vote for neighboring bins, just a single bin. And I computed an affine transformation only instead of a central matrix. So um, I also should note that Low uses a hash table to implement the Huff transform where I just use the full four-dimensional Huff array.